Quiet on the set. And action. Welcome to Media and Monuments Podcast, presented by Women in Film and Video in Washington, D.C. Media and Monuments is conversations featuring industry pros speaking on a wide range of topics of interest to media makers. We're living in a golden age of special effects, and while so much of what we see today is digitally created, there will always be a home for the physical, tangible art of special effects. I'm your host for this episode, Candace Block, and I'm super excited to be sitting down with an experienced special effects designer, prop maker, fabricator, and overall multi-talented creator, Ben Eady. Ben has worked on such projects as Star Trek Beyond, Arrow, The Predator, Ghostbusters Afterlife, more recently the film Prey and the Fraggle Rock TV series, and today we're going to chat more about building some of the magic that comes out of art departments. Welcome to the podcast, Ben. Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, So first of all, I'm an artist and a sculptor myself, and I've always considered working in a creature shop or creating special effects as a dream job. So I'm especially eager to learn how it is you got into this field. Did you come from an art or an engineering background or what is your unique story? I was raised in an artist like family. Um, The fact that I ended up in engineering is almost black sheep, but I I've managed to combine the two skills. How I got into it was as I was at a makerspace and uh, a girl I know at the makerspace had, you know, we chatted once in a while. She was making a vacuum former, Janet, she's amazing. And she's in the film industry. And I had worked as a freelance engineer for uh, at that point, it was like, well, 15 years. And she said that uh, her boss was looking for a crazy engineering type person that would help him design up some special effects and she goes do you mind if i give him your number and i said sure and didn't think much of it um and i got a call from a guy and he's like you know first thing he said this is like the best interview i've ever had he said can you send me your resume and i'm like sure and 15 minutes later um he didn't say don't forget about the resume but it was kind of just you know it was said in the in his tone because he's like okay i'm flying out to vancouver on saturday he's like clear your bill i'm gonna buy you up for about eight months and i'm like <laughs> oh, okay and wow. i had no idea what i was getting into um when i landed uh, the person who picked me up i'm like okay so what show is this and they were <laughs> like i'm not sure if i should say but you know it's better you know and like this is for star trek beyond now i, I wouldn't say i'm a hardcore Trekkie fan, but I'm definitely a fan. I was just like, <gasps> it's certainly a name you've heard of. You know, everyone, yeah. everyone's heard of of Star Trek. Yeah, um, that's awesome. That like you were just like thrown right in the deep end. It sounds like. Yeah, and apparently I did a good job because I'm still in the industry. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I find uh, you know as we do more and more interviews for this podcast, it's it's very a common thread that you know you you get into a project and as as long as you prove yourself, you just keep getting work that way, and it's all it's all who you know and connections. And there's everyone has a unique story, but there's sort of that common thread of just kind of a kind of a random introduction is is a common thing that happens. It is. Also, there's a certain mindset in there. Everybody seems to, like you, you fit in. Either you fit in or you don't. And it's it's nearly an instant thing. And that's one thing where I found like the, the personalities I, I understood and got along with. And because of that, you know, because you're in the team, essentially, then then you kind of stay there. But you have an engineering background. And yeah. is it that you've always kind of enjoyed tinkering and solving problems? Is that kind oh, yeah. of what what led you to making cool things that gives you this skill set? Yeah, you know, MacGyver growing up was like the ultimate hero for me, right? (laughs) I remember when I was like 12, I got a ghetto blaster for my Christmas gift. And, you know, the first thing most people would do is listen to it, which I did for, you know, a good 10 or 15 minutes, but I had to figure out what made it work as far as the tape deck goes and the eject system. So I pulled it apart. Mom walks into the room and I've literally got this thing in pieces on my on my desk and she freaks out and she's like, you have this back together in an hour. You're grounded for like, you know, the rest of your life. <laughs> and I, I managed to do it. <laughs> it was, That's such it was, a classic story, though. You you are one of those people that takes stuff apart and then figures out how to put it back together. That's yeah. awesome. And, and one of the proudest moments I had as a kid was, you know, just it was like a few months later, there was something wrong with our washing machine. And my mom called me down to, and said, hey, do you want to see if you can figure this out? And my dad came down because he was doing something into the basement. And um, he's like, well, why are you getting Ben to do it? And my mom looked at him and said, well, he'll fix it right the first time. 
And you can see mm. dad was confused because he was like, you know, he was proud that his kids done this, but he was also like, but what about me? You started your <laughs> reputation of being able to do this quite early. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's just what I, it's just, it's in my DNA. It's yeah. what I do. It's, it's yeah. what you're meant to do. It sounds like. Yeah. So fixing things and making things work and executing like moves or process, but often, especially in the movie industry, these things also need to look a certain way. Yeah. So do you have a favorite side of the partnership between function and form? Ghostbusters is a perfect example of where I sit in the movie industry because I'm not necessarily special effects and I'm not necessarily in the art department. I'm, I kind of bridge the gap between the two. So most shows I get into, they, they have a problem figuring out where I fit, like you know, what department am I in? Because like with, with Ghostbusters, the proton packs and the traps and the radio controlled uh, trap, those were a definite hybrid between special effects and, and art department because, you know, you got to make it look pretty, but it's got to be fully functional at the same time. And no one wants to be that person in between because, you know, in the film industry, like in any industry, it's always good to have be able to point the finger at who did this, right? Or at least be able to know responsibly. And, and that sounds really harsh, but the reasoning behind it is, is that if you're on set, cameras are rolling, it's super expensive. So you need to know exactly who to go to if something goes wrong so you can fix it as fast as you possibly can. So it's less about pointing fingers and more about just making sure things run smoothly. Because I grew up in an artistic type family, I can make things look good. Now I'm not, I'm just good enough to make things camera ready, right? I'm not, I'm okay to make things look good, but not, I'm not that guy. I'm not the one who makes those props that, you know, take your breath away. Um, but I'm also the guy that can make things run and understand the inner workings and be able to fix things. So being able to bridge those two things and be able to like, you know, I've come to set with like my rig is like tools and paint and, you know, glues and everything. So I do everything on specific props. And that's kind of where, again, it's I, I'm one of those ambiguous people that you can't really describe necessarily what I do, but I, I prefer the mechanical side of things. It's something I really understand. I, I generally am screaming at the art department for help because I'm, <laughs> I'm making things worse while trying to make it better. <laughs> right. So you you like the mechanical side, but you have the aesthetic foundation to make yeah, it yeah. to yeah. understand that as well, which is which is great. I mean, I think that's it's sort of I guess that makes you balanced brained as well or whatever they describe with all the different types of ways that I people suppose. think of the world. Yeah, I don't it know. can also be dangerous too, because sometimes you think you can do something when you really can't and you end up, you know, having to, <laughs> I, I eat a lot of humble pie. <laughs> well, that's part of the process of just growing and getting better in general yeah, in suppose. any field uh, is is learning from, from everything. You're creating tangible real life elements, um, mm -hmm. but there's sometimes a union between the physical and the digital before, during, and after. Yeah. Um, how often are you on a computer compared to getting your hands dirty? Like I know you, you do like a lot of design work and maybe pre-designing things or. You know, that's a, that's a very good question. I'd say it's, it's almost a 50, 50 split because oh, wow. pre-production is, is a large portion of it. And, you know, sitting down and even if I'm receiving props from a prop house, you know, major modifications or me sorting it out and documenting it or, um, making 3D printed pieces, repair pieces that I can see going wrong. Like you can always reach out to prop houses to, to make these pieces for you, but they're going to be expensive. That's, you know, that's, it's, their time is super valuable. And if I'm already on production and I have access to this stuff, then, then I can save a couple of bucks by like say 3D printing or manufacturing repair parts or making something right from scratch. There's also the added bonus of in-house if something breaks, you're not calling up a prop house asking for an emergency thing and having to wait until the next day or a couple of days to get the pieces. I can go to the shop and make it. Uh, so in the end, yeah, it's it's totally both sides. Um, it, it yeah, really, it all depends on on the circumstances too, because there's there's somewhere it'll be VFX heavy, which means that I'm fully in engineering mode and I just have to, you know, paint it green and, and give them some markers versus making something that's got to look good on camera that they are going to, you know, get it all done straight in, in lens. Mm -hmm. That's true. I mean, yeah, it sounds like you've got your hands on quite a lot of the process. You are 
definitely uh, a, a, like a multi-tool on set. I've, I've been told that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I think is, is, is a great person to have because, you know, you cover a lot of, of areas. And True. And depending on what show you're on, there was a, a moment in, in one show, I'm not going to say which one, but I remember the director saying, hey, can you send Ben over? And they're like, but this is a setback issue. And he's like, I don't give up bleep yeah <laughs> who wants to i know ben can fix it so do yeah. me ben. <laughs> man well maybe maybe a new a new category is being created by you sort of uh, like, MacGyver, you, set MacGyver, exactly <laughs> yeah so something specific but that's i mean i i think a lot of people especially when in filmmaking have experience in other avenues than what they're focused on on that particular project anyway so it's it's kind of cool that you get to actually use all of those or multiple sets of skills in this a, in is where project. Project. Yeah, I don't like, you know, I'm ADHD and a little on the hyperactive side, right? So this this feeds in for, for me, this is where what some see as a disability becomes a superpower. And and because of that, um, yeah, I it, it's I get so excited going to work and stuff. Uh, doing engineering was great and fine. Um, to be completely honest, I made more money, but I'm truly happy doing film because it's where I get to do a little bit of everything and, it, and that totally excites me. Yeah, and satisfy kind of an artistic element too. Which yes, is, absolutely. Oh, sounds like uh, you, you really did find a, a lovely path in life. It sounds like I'm I'm jealous, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm also I one of those I people. to deserve this, but I'm, I'm just kind of going with it, you know? Well, it sounds like you're proving yourself and people, I mean, the fact that they know that they can count on you is is a, a really awesome stamp of, you know, approval yeah. that you're doing, you're doing what you're meant to be doing. Yeah. A lot of these projects, uh, they obviously range in the types of projects. There's a lot in action and horror genres, but also yeah. comedies and fun creatures like in Fraggle Rock and whatnot. Do you gravitate towards one project more than another? Or does the creation process change at all uh, the tone of it? Or, or is it just the same vibe working on it, whether it's a fun, lighthearted, quirky thing? <laughs> that is a great question, because I, I've been kind of questioning that recently is that like, I, I definitely am, I, I'd say, I'm not going to say pigeonholed, but that's where, you know, you start on something like Star Trek, so you're sci-fi. And then, you know, I've done some some horror stuff, but it was very mechanically inclined as far as the special effects. And, uh, yeah, there, there's not a whole lot of dramas or anything like that that I work on. I think a lot of it is is that uh, what I end up doing is is definitely fiction and outside of, of reality. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you need a certain mindset for it. Do you have a preference for a genre type? I don't have a preference. I want to make things that move around. Like I, I love robotics aspects or people asking me to do the impossible. With my engineering firm, there was one of one of my testimonials I had from one of my clients. It was one of the proudest moments is he said that when everybody else says no, you need to call Ben. And, and part of that is I've got this bravado that I don't say no. And I desperately wish I did sometimes, but people go, can you do this? And I invariably will say yes. And I like to think my track record's pretty good and I will make it happen. But the bridge between the actual saying, yes, I can do this and actually doing it can be loaded with a mountain of stress. Um, don't get me wrong, I, I love my job, but there are times where like, I'm, I'm like, you know, my head's in my hands, I'm slumped over my desk, just about in tears going, what the heck did I just do, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so in that uh, sense also, can you maybe talk to us about some of either the largest and most complex builds and also some of maybe the smallest or, Sm smallest, not necessarily in simplest, yeah. but smallest in like physical size too, types of things. Yeah, you, you know, I've I've done things where um, we needed to stuff an LED light into something just for a little blink, and there was no room and and be able to control it. You know, we're talking things the size of your pinky fingernail, um, and you know that that's that's just as complex, if not harder, than some of the giant stuff. But most complex most dangerous things I've done would be uh, the two rotating sets for Star Trek Beyond. These things were, you know, 35 feet in diameter for one, 45 feet in diameter for the other. Um, one was 100 feet long, the other was 80 feet long. Um, we needed 1600 horsepower to rotate these things at the velocities they needed. 
So, you know, that alone was was like terrifyingly huge. If you look at it at an engineering point of view, if somebody came to me with a project like that, I'd be looking at a two year uh, design um, R&D and approval process. And you're given like literally three months and you're just like, pardon? <laughs> at the same time, you got to make it safe. And that's where, you know, um, it comes into the to the next more complex thing. It was less complex uh, engineering wise, but danger wise is insane. Is they have these car cannons or car flippers. So you've got a car cannon. You've got a, a guy driving a vehicle with effectively, you know, a bomb on the back and it's going to flip the car and you got to make sure that it's not going to hurt him. It's going to make the car flip. It's going to do exactly what you want it to because you can't have a car flip the wrong way. And the next thing you know is that, right. you know, like the, the stunt people that I know of, um, I maybe it's me, but I, I seek out. I want to meet the people that are going to do this because if you befriend these people, then suddenly the stakes are higher. Because the stakes are higher, you're going to be safer. And I think it's... It, but emotionally, it it can wreck you. Um, with with a lot of pressure, predator, yeah. <laughs> the, not the last predator, the second last predator. We did a car cannon, and Leaf, the driver, you know, I met him. Really enjoyed his company. He's an amazing guy. And then he's doing something with this this Humvee and a car cannon. I was terrified until we had an all clear after the stunt was done. I honestly don't think I I took a breath for like five minutes working closely with stunt performers and safety crews, yeah. seems like there's a really great sort of symbiotic relationship that you guys have. Yeah, and, and if there's anybody in engineering and stuff, if you wanna make friends with the stunt people, here is something I did, and I didn't realize that a lot of people didn't do, and stunts always had to go out and ask, is I made a, a robotic uh, skating rig so Anna Kendra could look like she could skate like a professional in, in the well. And, but the, we have this robot she's standing on that weighs about 100 pounds, can go 30 kilometers an hour, and it's around a bunch of people that are skating. Um, this can be very dangerous. Anybody slips or something like that, and they, they have like a 100-pound robot slamming it to their head. It's not cool. So um, what I, I managed to make everything, and then I made literally made a giant red button on a remote, <laughs> and I come up to the stunt coordinator and handed him this, and he's like, what's that? And I'm like, if I screw up, you hit that, everything stops. And he literally is just like, wow, thank yeah, you. an emergency stop button. Right, like, <laughs> just literally make a giant emergency stop button. You can handle to hand mm -hmm. to stunts or to whoever is coordinating and go, look, you know, I'm not, I'm flawed. So if I'm driving, somebody else is driving, here's, here's the second thing. And, yeah. and you're the best person to look at, you know, think of these things. Always look at, like, even if it's a, um, the remote trap vehicle, the little RTV radio controlled vehicle in Ghostbusters. It's fun. It's this little tiny trap thing, like what, a little bigger than a shoebox with wheels on it. And everybody's like, oh, it's cute and it's awesome. This thing weighs about 15 pounds and can do 50 miles an hour. If you look at the impulse of that thing hitting something, it would kill someone. Yeah. So this cute little or toy. certainly break no something longer... at least. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you got you to gotta really pay attention to, yeah, it looks awesome, but it's not, you know? Yeah. Oh, wow. So, I mean, it, so it sounds like you've also made some great friendships and relationships with stunt people and obviously the crews and stuff that you work on. Are, uh, is your network and community of, of people that do this, do you have people you work with time and time again? So the relationships is interesting. Um, you know, for first few years and stuff, you know, I said you get along and you kind of fit in. Um, like any group, you're, there's going to be friction. There's always going to be friction. So one thing, Janet, the the person who got me into the to movie industry, one of the first pieces of advice she took, she we went out for coffee and she goes, you're gonna have to be aware of a few things. She's gonna, she said that people are gonna do stupid stuff, and you're just gonna have to sit there and and shake your head. And then later they're gonna come up to you and they're gonna say, I'm sorry, but like in the heat of the moment. And she goes, you need to pay attention to that. And you also, when you screw up or you lash out at somebody, because it will happen, is always go back as soon as you as soon as you're out of that that feeling and in that scenario and go and apologize. Don't ever hesitate to think I'm right, they're wrong. Best piece of advice I was ever given because you're in the heat of the moment. It's almost like I, I'm ex infantry, so it's it's almost like you're in the heat of a battle, right? You don't have time to deal with emotions while you're doing it, but afterwards you definitely have to address them because you're going to damage relationships. So that all being said is that um, 
you know, at first I thought, hey, I fit in, things are good, but you always make those follies and people are upset and you can you can step back and, and make amends for a lot of this. At the same time, there's going to be amends that you can't make. There's some people that aren't going to like it. And, you know, um, like any industry, I've got a lot of people that, that don't like me and that's okay. I'm, I'm, I try to be a, a people pleaser. I try to have everybody like me. Uh, maybe more so than than most, and and it, it can be a bit of a flaw. At at the same time, you know, I've got people in industry that that really do not like me, and vice versa. There's people I'll never work for again. But you know, again, that's okay. It, there's there's room in an industry that you can breathe. So, and you're gonna have the one person that comes to you and says, "You're never gonna work in this industry again." I thought. When somebody told me that, I laughed and I thought, you got to be kidding me. Like, that's such a petty, stupid thing. It literally, minus one word was quote unquote told to me and left wow. on a phone message once. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, really? <laughs> and, and, but they're, you know, they're, they're good people that are, I won't, you know what? I'm not necessarily going to say they're good people. They're, they're <laughs> people that are trying very hard to make a living and, and, you know, maybe they're desperate or they're cornered or something like that. And you got to have sympathy, even, even if they're, they're mean, they're trying. And it's still, what I'm trying to get to yeah. is that the emotional side of things can be a barrier. And I've seen a lot of exceptionally talented people leave the industry because of petty, stupid things other people have said. I don't want to say grow a thick skin because I don't think the world needs any more thick skin. I think it's a matter of be be sympathetic, be understanding, be compassionate. At the same time, you're never going to please everybody. So sometimes you're going to get hit and it's going to hurt. But remember, it's probably worth it. And that next time it's not going to be that way. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it, this is people it's a whole bunch of people people we're all human uh everyone has the emotions and especially in doing the type of stuff that you do there's a lot of pressure and yeah. high stakes moments and that elevates emotion and so that's a good reminder to to understand that everyone's human and things happen there's stresses but still be a good person because you're working with that and then also cr projects are just different little families too yeah. so not everybody gets along with everybody in the world and that's okay <laughs> well, you know given this podcast and the women in film this is one thing that suddenly maybe it's just come to me is that I, when push comes to shove, the people I lean on are almost always the women in my department or around because I think men are taught to hide and bottle everything up and they don't learn how to cope with emotions well and they don't know how to cope with them in the moment. But women seem to be the ones who are in our society are taught to deal with that and they're constantly under pressure. And because of that, when you know, push comes the shove and, you know, the stuff hits the fan. Women are the ones who can keep level and and be able to to get things done. Uh, that actually kind of reminds me of the premise of, of She-Hulk a little bit. I don't know if yeah. you've seen it, but but when they, when Bruce is all how how are you able to quickly go back and forth between she's like, I'm a woman. I'm used to dealing with <laughs> with keeping it's, it's things so true, in though. control. Yeah. Yeah, like you know, there's um this this Ashley in in props here in in Calgary, and um there's times where she would come up and it, it was funny. She'd be asking me like, "What's this for? What's that for?" And I'm like, "Why does this this matter?" She's like, "Just just help me out in figuring all this out." And then I realized later in production, I'd be in the middle of a set, I can't run to the trailer, and I'd be like, "Wait a minute, Ashley knows everything." I'm like, "Can you grab you know this widget and that widget and bring it here?" And every time she would do it perfectly and grab the right things and know what was going on. I'd ask somebody else in the department to come and get stuff. And they, they, I'd be on the radio talking back and forth thinking this would have taken less time for me to run out to the trailer. Like it's, it's one of those where, yeah. You, well, that's you a good piece of advice then to, to try to, <laughs> yeah, to, to, um, for anyone, I guess, uh, it's a good piece of advice to get to know, every, like, understand more so you can be, it, it could be a more well-oiled machine when when stuff gets going. Yeah, and that, I, I guess that could be in, in some way sexist against men because, you know, there are guys out there that are cued in like that, um, but the vast majority aren't. How about that? <laughs> um, I guess we could switch to getting into some specifics of some of the uh, projects you've made too, because I know uh, people would be really interested to hear uh, about that. Um, I know 
when people think of stuff like you already talked about like the the big rotating sets in star trek and some of the things in um in ghostbusters and all of that but uh what were some of the props you made for fraggle rock for example like can you get into that so yeah fraggle rock and stuff uh, uh the doozer vehicles uh the the tracked vehicles and stuff you know um i love the doozers i'm so yeah, i'm such a the, doozer fan yeah <laughs> i everybody said you know why aren't there more doozers and stuff it, it, it's something that you know it's definitely been heard by production um so yeah the doozer vehicles that was a, the, a lot of the work i did or that the monorail that you saw um you know like anything anything i do is a team effort you know i i can talk about how you know i designed up the the rotating sets in star trek and stuff the reality is is that i did the vast majority of the the design but you know you have double checkers you have other people come in i didn't have time to figure out the engine mounts we brought in another engineer to help out with that so with the doozer vehicles you know um We've got uh, a whole team of people working on that. I, I made sure that they could roll properly and I was in charge of like handling a lot of the 3D printing and stuff that needed to be done for them. Um, yeah, so in the end it was like sort of remote control stuff that I'd, I'd managed with it. Uh, so much fun. I just, you know, and there there were a lot of interesting challenges. That's That's one thing is that you get asked to build something that you know doesn't exist and you know that it can but like how do you affect that like how does how does that the the giant dome that goes over top of them in, on that tractor is probably the hardest thing to get done because if you want to blow it in glass it's it's several thousand dollars just to make the mold and then each glass piece and then whether that breaks or not and then the weight we ended up 3d printing it um and through a system or through through a group that came out of China because they could do optically clear prints and it was much less expensive, but knowing where to go and look for that stuff is, is kind of, you know, where you know, I fit in, you know, it's nobody's made this before and it's like, okay, well, I've done 40 different things in eight different industries that might apply. So let's just start, right. you know, hitting the check boxes and seeing which one works. You have a lot you can draw from at this point. Um, yeah, because yeah, it sounds like uh, obviously everyone learns something new with each project and you take your knowledge, move forward, improving and streamlining and yeah. building your skills. Um, so do you do you like uh, I, I'm sure there are times maybe when you know exactly what to do and you execute mm -hmm. it and it gets done. Are there are there great times that you're still learning really, really fun yeah. new challenges yeah, that's i i absolutely love learning something new right <laughs> and there's there there is literally an adrenaline kick when you get something to do what you want it to um especially after a struggle um mm -hmm. you know in, in some ways you know when i was in my infantry days and stuff i did a lot of rock climbing and skydiving and hang gliding i was always in for the adrenaline yeah, now the because of a family and stuff, I slowed down a little less uh, death-defying stuff that I do. Um, <laughs> but you still get your adrenaline. <laughs> I still get the adrenaline rush from these little design things. And every show, there's always something that will confuse you. I love love puzzles. I you know people still buy me puzzles for Christmas, and you know I, everybody. I, I still to this day have people trying to stump me and. Um, there's only one puzzle that ever got me down, but it, it took me six months to solve it. But like, literally, I will spend six months until <laughs> I solve it. <laughs> That's a personality trait I can kind of relate to. So I, I, I get you there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sol solving things. There's a there's a great kind of like high in satisfaction from finally yeah. getting it. That's that's great. And it's, it's cool that you get to make a living doing that kind of and, stuff. And the sad thing is you have to accept this, but like you'll you'll spend like, say, six months solving a puzzle. And then somebody's going to come off the street and go, hey, did you know there's this one little trick? And you go, bloop, bloop, bloop. Yep. And you're just like, <laughs> where were you six months ago? <laughs> but it's okay. You are that to other people as well. So that's good. You know, at least yeah. at least I'm sure you're you're taking enlightening some frustrated person who is trying to figure it out. And you're like, no, 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 you just you just do this. Yeah, um, it's, it's the person where you're, you're struggling on, on some software, the guy reaches over your shoulder and goes, have you tried hitting the S button? I'm sure a lot of people, especially um, when this is going to come out, are curious. Do you love Halloween? And do you like, oh uh, do you do cosplay or make special displays or haunted houses or anything? Is that a holiday you love? Well, okay, Halloween. I, I've always loved Halloween and stuff. Um, you know, this is where this is where Ben's a little different than most is, is that my joy in Halloween is the build. My my joy isn't necessarily wearing the costume and stuff. I, I would, but I 
the the look on a kid's face or somebody else's face when you build something i'm going for that that reaction to whatever i've built i'm i don't have to be the person wearing it i don't so you build for others more often than yeah or like even I'll, i'll still do stuff for myself but it's i'm going for the reaction i'm not going for uh, you know, look at me and Mm -hmm. trying to boost my ego. I've already got an inflated ego thinking like, (laughs) no, I can build everything. So there's something coming up that I'm super, super excited about that. I've been working on this, this robot. Um, we're going to do some live, uh, event stuff here coming in middle October. It turned out to be something that everybody thought would be complex, but the best solution was something that was so simple that every, like even myself is just sitting there going, I can't believe this is how you solve this. But uh, yeah, it, it'll be fun. Thanks. Anyway, that's where this job is awesome because for me, a lot of the times my, you know, Halloween's all year round. It sounds like you have your personal projects and your paid stuff um, and that you help your friends and you do cosplay or helping them with cosplay and things as well, because that is a year round sort of creation. Oh, it totally is. And and like when I'm not working, going to cosplay conventions and stuff and getting ideas and oh, my God, that's one thing. I okay. so at movies, you've got people that are getting paid to be there because they're good actors or something like that. But they don't necessarily want to be there. like a vast majority do, but occasionally they don't. But you go to a con, everybody wants to be there. And that energy, oh, my God, it's so awesome. (laughs) Are there any cons that are your favorite? Yeah, I just came from Adam Savage's Silicon. Um, So in my in my travels, Adam and I, uh, well, Adam did a prop for for uh, Ghostbusters. And because of that, I got to work directly with him. And, you know, it went from this this person I admired and fanboyed out over on TV to he's a friend of mine. And we talk regularly. And I still can't believe I'm saying that. I That's just, awesome. <laughs> but, but he's, you know, it was one of those where this was, this was a moment in my life that I truly, I will forever remember is that um, we did an interview in my trailer about some of the props. And then, um, you know, later he was back in my my trailer at lunch. Now I I have lunch and take a nap because that's just you know I'm I'm middle aged. I'm I'm getting old. I like to have a nap. So I go to have a nap in my trailer, and Adam's there, and I'm like, oh, did you miss something? Do you need something? And he's like, no, man. Do you, do you mind if I just hang out? Because like I really enjoy your company. And I was just like what <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's that's someone who who does get along with you yeah yeah <laughs> not everyone you said not everyone does but it's great when you find people that get that get your vibe and, yeah. and stuff as well yeah <laughs> That's so cool. Um, so obviously, as anyone listening can tell, we could talk about a ton of awesome projects and yep. get into all the things that you uh, can do. Um, I would just say really quickly before we tell people where they can learn more, is there any um, sort of advice you might give to someone wanting to get into this, like any maybe materials or pr- skills that they should get as a foundation? If you've got a skill set that is close to being able to do something, but you're not sure, say yes. There was something a, a a coach of mine, a business coach of mine had told me, and there, there was two phrases, and there's yes, but, and yes, and. So any question you answer with a yes. The the caveats are is that if you, if you know it's something you can do and you can knock out of the park and it's an easy job, you say yes, and here's some other things that we can add to it. And it makes people feel good, right? Because you're, you're going to outperform and they're always going to remember that. Um, yes, but is that, yes, I can do this, but it's going to take me a lot of time or uh, we'll need more equipment or we're going to need more money. So the but is the, the negative. Um, and it, it sort of covers your, your butt in the sense that your butt. That it also covers your butt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it covers you in the sense that um, you you will get some of those yes buts. They will say, yeah, go ahead, do it, because you know the the risk reward for the director or the producer will be you know good enough that they're willing to try it, and they'll also know that there's an inherent risk. The reason I'm saying all of this is every question they ask you is met with an immediate yes, and because it's always met with an immediate yes people remember that and they'll come to you because you will have the solutions. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to affect the solution, but it does mean that you always say yes, instead of having the person go, oh, no, we can't because don't be that person. Go yes, but, or yes, and. And if you can ingrain those two things into your head, you're going to find that people really like 
to work with you because you've got you've got the the yes mindset. At the same time, you're going to say yes to stuff that's going to stress you out beyond your wildest dream. <laughs> and you think that, you know, the next show, I'm not going to do it. And you're going to do it on the next show. Just accept that it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's some really excellent advice. I know uh, you have a YouTube channel where you offer tips yeah. and tricks and things like that and tutorials. Um, so I guess if people want to learn more about you and your work or connect or collaborate or anything, um, mm -hmm. tell, tell us where they can find you uh, online. <laughs> So online first is like my YouTube channel and you can find that at uh, YouTube and then uh, forward slash backslash, you know, the slash and then yeah. <laughs> uh, Ben Edie. My last name's kind of spelled weird, but you can see it in the text, I'm sure, in the description. And we'll put here. it in the show notes as well. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, Instagram um, is a tongue in cheek thing that I really like is it, it popped into my head is I'm known as like, you know, a maker. So I, I became the Dread Maker Roberts instead of their Dread Pirate Roberts because oh, it's like okay. one of my favorite movies ever. And so, uh, yeah, you can find me there. And, you know, that's one thing is my name is not that hard to spell. And it's unique enough that if you Google my name, I, I kind of own the first pages. <laughs> so you can find that's me nice. there. Yeah. But yeah, YouTube's kind of where I'm, I'm trying to branch out. I'd like to spend a little more. Movies are great. But this is another little piece of advice. Movies are great, but you're going to spend an awful, the long hours, long, long hours. And at the end of a show, last couple of months, you're going to easily be doing 12 hour days, six to seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to raise a family doing that, it can be tough. Right. So I'm trying to spend some more time with my family. And my YouTube channel is at the point where it makes just enough money that I can, you know, take little extended breaks between movies and i'm hoping that maybe i can do it more on a regular basis so yeah go to my youtube <laughs> yeah definitely check that out that is uh it's it's got some awesome stuff on there i subscribe now as well thank you so much for chatting with us and we'll definitely i i am going to keep my eyes peeled for some of these great new projects that yeah. you've got uh coming down the pipeline and uh yeah everyone check it out Thank you for listening to Media and Monuments, a service of Women in Film and Video in Washington, D.C. Please remember to review, rate, and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. For more information about WIF, please visit our website at WIF as in Frank, V as in Victor, dot org. That's a wrap!